Um, so hopefully the person in Zoom can hear me. We do have some microphones. If you can, please go to the chat box and just like let us know. Um, also, as we're going through um, the workshop, if you have any questions for those on Zoom, feel free to chat in the group chat and I will re relay them to our host. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Engelson and I'm a science librarian here at the University of Maine. I'm also on the workshops team, so we put on workshops. Welcome to the two of you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, hey, come on in and um, sign in and then come in and have a seat. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna get started. Um, I do have a few announcements before we start. And the first one is that I'm not sure about our future workshops. Either they're all gonna be on Zoom or maybe we will cancel them. If you are interested in what we are doing, um, check out the Fogler Library events page or you can sign up to be on our events list and we will let you know if things are happening. Um, second thing is that there are feedback forms on your table. You did give us some information, but this is actual like feedback about the workshop and you know Danielle's performance and stuff like that. So any of that, always good. Um, so please at the end do that. For those on Zoom, I have a link for you for a Google form um, that you can fill out at the end. And uh, so without further ado, um, our presenter today is uh, Dr. Danielle Levesque. She is an assistant professor associate Assistant. Yes. Assistant. Okay. Assistant. Few years. Um, in of mammalogy in the School of Biology and Ecology, and also responsible for some of the coolest facts about mammals that I have never even heard of. Um, she has made many posters and has judged many posters, and today she's going to tell all of you about some of the best ways to create effective posters for whatever you need to create the posters for. And she's judging my poster. Fantastic. Yes, thank you. Oh. <laughs> I have so, opinions. No. Without <laughs> further ado, Danielle. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Emory. Um, yeah, so if you can't hear me again, just uh, text her and then I'll talk to you guys in the, in the room. Um, so I had originally kind of agreed to this because I've seen common mistakes show up at the Cougar Symposium, but you guys are going to the water thing, same deal. Uh, there's this movement towards different posters that we'll talk about, but the number one thing when it comes to um, poster presentations is it's scientific communication, right? And so the first thing you wanna think about when you're designing a poster or a talk is what the number one thing you want people to get from your stuff. So what's the main take home message of your research? And then you kind of work backwards that way. Um, students in particular have this habit, and that's great, of trying to put in as much as possible to show all the hard work you've been doing. And unfortunately, sometimes that takes away from the central message of what you're trying to get across. And so um, I have a couple of examples of posters uh, from my field that's uh, biology. Some they think they've worked okay and others that, that probably had too much text, it tends to be the general thing. Um, and uh, as, um, sorry, I'm blanking on your name right now. Dalton. As Dalton had mentioned, there's this new kind of way that people have suggested to do posters that I'll just kind of show you for a second here. There's a great video that's worth looking at. And so what the guy is arguing is that Scientific conferences tend to be these big, busy meetings where sometimes you can't get as much information from posters just by walking down the sea of information. And so what he's actually suggested is this particular format that I'm not a huge fan of, um, where there's a lot of blank space in the middle that has the central message. And then kind of the idea is you have, um, actually, sorry, Dalton, I'm gonna use the one you sent me as an example, if you don't mind, um, where say you're, you're standing by your poster, you're standing on this side, and when someone comes to talk to you, you're gesturing over the visuals, people who are just wandering by in the distance will have your central message, and then people who are waiting to talk to you will have this section here of, of all the information they need. And in theory, it works really well. I just don't think it's very visually appealing. And so um, there's a really great Times Higher Ed article on it that I've linked to that has some of the criticisms. But the one thing um, I looked at before, sorry, I'm new to sharing um, screens, is that if you look up what people have actually done in practice, it tends to be a more modified version that's still a bit more visually appealing. So I do like the title across the top because the other part of it, as an advisor, um, your poster doesn't just last for the conference. I like to have it outside my office and something with that much blank space, the way that the kind of better poster design is, 
isn't as appealing to me. So, so Dalton, what I did was I took yours and I just moved things around a little bit. Yeah. I'm sorry, my PowerPoint is slow when I do this. I might stop sharing the screen that way. It's gonna show up eventually. We have two hours. Yeah, it's not gonna. Um, so I wouldn't do it exactly like this, and I, you could still make the title bigger, but just a thought about moving things around a bit so that it still has that kind of linear thing that makes people happy. <laughs> but the, the big take home of all of this is like, there's no wrong way to do a poster. Um, I was just talking to a colleague about a completely different thing, and I mentioned I was doing this talk, and she sent me two posters, one that she thinks is okay, but has too much text, and the other one that um, she did as kind of a modified version after this uh, better poster thing came out. And so the older one is, um, no, <laughs> sorry, she does them longer because it was for a conference that had a different form, um, where she has kind of a background that I think is a little distracting, but she's got some cool pictures. And so you'll notice that the introduction has just a couple sentences, and then the rest of it is methods, because it is more of a methods um, paper at this point in time. But there's very few, um, or the visuals are all kind of really there for a good reason, and there's very little text. And so in this case, it was a methods poster, which is valid to do. And I was expecting for the cougar thing that there'd be some people that were still at that kind of early stage. So I wanted to show that um, as kind of a good example. But the one she sent me that she'd based on this better poster thing, I think is gorgeous. She works on dung beetles. Um, and so now what she's done is, is had that concept, right, where you have your central take home message of your poster in big letters with some really pretty visuals and just like what you need to understand afterwards. So this, the thing to think about is you wanna kind of highlight your introduction somewhere. You do wanna have enough information so that people can know what you've done and then also highlight your conclusions. So having a kind of left to right linear idea where you have, you know, this is what we wanted to do, this is what we did, and your conclusions is still a good idea, but being able to highlight that kind of one sentence take home message like what you had in your slide, in a way that's visual as well, I think is the way to do it now. So um, it also helps if you have a really gorgeous study species. <laughs> but there's, yeah, um, there's different ways to kind of think about it. So two from, from my students, I'm not gonna make them fill up the whole screen. So the one I showed earlier, I think had a bit too much text. This was from an undergrad a few years ago. Um, but part of it was we weren't 100% sure of the central message of it yet. Uh, but we did have some information on the study species because they were a little weird. And then you can have things smaller. And so it is important to have references and acknowledgements. And we were unfortunately funded by like five different institutions. So the logos took up a lot of space. <laughs> um, but one I like a lot better is, um, where did it go? I had to quit PowerPoint because Zoom didn't like it for a second. So let me find where everything went. Um, there we go. And this one's not complete. It has some of my comments on it. I am going to make it fill the screen just because. Um, so my student was in ecology and environmental sciences and decided to take the colors from the logo and put it as backgrounds. Uh, and I kind of really like it. I had suggested she added a result so far, so it's not complete. But you can see it's kind of a mix of text, but really clear, like these are the research questions, methods, and then some graphics. Uh, and I thought it went over really well and it still looks really nice outside my office. Um, so, I don't know, there's lots of options. I put some tips on, um, so I did put together a document that Anne Marie is gonna be able to share with anyone who wants it on Google Docs that has links um, to various websites that say how to do it. There's one that I like in particular that hopefully I can bring up. Um, sorry, this screen popping up right where we need it is a pain. It was called Better Posters before the guy came up with the Better Poster videos, where they'll kind of highlight really, really nice ones and people can walk through their justifications for why they did it. Um, 
And I strongly recommend looking at it because they have examples from all over. But this idea of minimizing the amount of text other than what you want people to read and really emphasizing the data, I think is a really nice, nice way to do that. Um, and it helps if your title is what you want to have as a take home, but if it wasn't, you could also always have your kind of main message here too. So, so there's ways to kind of adapt that. And this, this particular website is great because they really do walk through all sorts of um, different options that people have done and what works and what doesn't work. And usually what happens is they'll review someone's poster and say like, I would do this differently than that. Um, the other thing that I've added is a link to, and I couldn't find the right website just yet, but I can. Um, there is a website that will you can load up your poster and see what it would look like if you were colorblind. Um, and that's always an important consideration for presentations too. Because uh, it's important to remember that large part, it's weird in my field, there's like a small subset of colorblind people that we all kind of know, and so we don't mess with them, but it's something that we kind of keep in mind. Um, and the other thing is there's, there's a great video on why you shouldn't use bar plots, and they're an ineffective way to look at data, <laughs> and so I've linked to that as well. Um, so I kind of put all the information there if you want to take a look at what people are doing. The other thing to note, and I downloaded the copy, is that most societies, so the water conference is a bit more of an interdisciplinary one, but you could find whatever society your advisor would usually go to, will have information on posters for presenters. And the nice thing about that is you'll often get the people who are judging um, be the ones that write it and they'll have their kind of specific pet peeves on there, which is kind of nice. So I, I found an example, this is the Canadian Society of Zoologists, um, who, and Brent is just really good at, who has the specific you know, hints that kind of work for um, the audience for that specific field, because there are gonna be field specific differences, but there's like a lot of information out there on, on how to do it. I realize I just threw a bunch of information at you. Is there any <laughs> questions so far? No, I like that. I like the resources Yeah, it's kind of, it's weird that there's, there's no one right way to do it. Um, and there's, I suppose there's quite a few wrong ways to do it. Um, I would say the number one thing, and I've done it in the past too, is like too much text can be a big thing. And so taking time to, um, really think about, again, what the number one thing you want and then working backwards from there, I think is the best thing I could suggest. The other thing that I've put in the document is that um, I think it's really important that, and Brant says it too, uh, your poster needs to stand alone, right? So if somebody is there, because oftentimes poster sessions are really busy and people will go and wander when it's quiet because some people don't like people either or judges will go afterwards, uh, but your presentation should enhance it. And so what I always suggest for students to do is prepare like a 30 minute, 30 minute, 30 second, this is what my poster is. And so when someone comes up to you and says, tell me about your poster, you talk to them for 30 seconds, and then you stop. And then you wait, and then they ask more and you continue. Because I've had it before, the Cougar one is terrible, where they have you judging like 20 posters in an hour and you get stuck. And a really enthusiastic student is taking you through their entire poster and after about five minutes you're going like, I, I gotta go, sorry. So if you give people that like really quick 30 second to one minute overview, for one thing, the sign of a good presenter and someone who knows what they're talking about is someone who could really distill it down that quickly. And then you could open up to, do you have more questions? Would you like me to explain it some more and you can go into the nitty gritty. Because the way I always feel about posters, and the one thing that the Better Posters guy is really good at talking about is he suggests putting a QR code on posters that takes you to, um, that's that, that, that'll take you to the paper if it's published or a bigger version of the poster. I, I always see posters and talks as like a, an advertisement for your real research. And so, you give people the kind of central message and then if they want to know more, they'll ask you more. If they don't want to know more because they have a gazillion other things to do, then they'll go and do that. So kind of think of it with that in mind. So it means it doesn't have to contain absolutely everything. If you're going to a really field specific conference, then you do want to make sure that you have stuff that you know that the field is going to want. 
so that people, although it's always good to have people come find you for stuff afterwards, um, but you don't really want that much information or more information than you need. So it's hard to find that like balance sometimes with just as much as you need and no more. Um, and, and walking it through. So I would suggest, you know, showing it to your advisor, to your friends, um, people who aren't in your field and say, does this make sense to you? Does it look pretty? And then getting feedback on that and practicing your talk before you go to kind of helps you get prepared for it. So what were um, the person who wrote this or what were his um, reasons we didn't like the way they designed these posters? I think it is just that there's not enough information for people who are in the room. I don't like QR codes. They don't work for me. Yeah, I don't have one. The majority of people going to scientific conferences are still going to be older than like 40 years old. And so, <laughs> so part of it is like, yes, okay, it gets the idea that if you're walking through a giant room, all of a sudden you're going to be picking up a lot more information. But you still have, need to have enough information. And tiny little text like that on the side is still going to have the same problem set of big poster text, which is why like, I was really happy that the first hit that came up when I, when I looked at the Twitter, um, I just sound really old by saying the Twitter, uh, sorry, I'm really going to have to learn how to do Zoom quick, um, was this, because it really does take the kind of yeah. central take home thing, but there's not a lot of text on here. He's oh, using yeah. a QR code. It's just really visually appealing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you keep going down, you can see most people did like a kind of modified, but I think that's too busy. It's like he's using the central idea, but it's still kind of too busy on the rest of it. And so it means if someone's standing back around a big crowd and a really busy poster, they're still gonna have to kind of squint at the text and you get to the, some of the same problems. So you can see a lot of people have kind of taken it and changed it a little bit, but just that whole idea of like making sure that like, then this is kind of a good idea of a good, They've shrunk it a little bit. Um, so that I think the concept of having like your main take home point being somewhere visible is great, but the sort of it taking up 50% of your poster and the rest still being small on the side is what people have had problems with. And I, I, I can't figure out if it's just like, oh, it's new, I'm not used to it, or if it's like, it's not pretty. And I think it's a bit of both. Like, I don't like that blank space going all the way up to the top. That's probably just me, <laughs> but. I, I like the idea of having like the title and like the authors, like the first one I was up uh, top that you showed us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like having like the title and the authors yeah. and the university and stuff below that. Um, I'll probably do that, even, even, even though my name's only one on the poster. It's the same, the same difference. <laughs> you still have, it's still the idea you have the author line, the affiliation line, and then the logos, and everybody's happy when you yeah, put their logos up. And... That's usually how it works. <laughs> I say that, I just let my students submit an abstract where there's three names on it, but the abstract says I a bunch, so we're fine. <laughs> um, and so, so there is like tiny text at the bottom here that I'm assuming is like references and acknowledgements and mm -hmm. stuff. So it's still good to have that on there in case someone's like, oh, who funded this? I'm always like that. <laughs> it's like, oh, how can I get funding for this and where did they come from? Um, I also really like that he includes his um, social media contacts too. Yep. A big part of going to conferences is networking and getting mm -hmm. to know other people. So if you do have a professional Twitter account or something like that where you share a lot of your work, that's a great idea to have on there as your handle. Yeah. And some people will have like a tiny picture of them saying, I'm the one presenting in case they're curious about it. I've seen people too have a little like one of those plastic um, things you can put papers in with printouts of their poster that people can take home. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of, because what it is, I, I always see it as like, yeah, it's a, it's a big version of like a quite business card type thing for, for, your, for your poster. Mm. Um, I went to a um, library conference last year in May, and one of the greatest parts is that they had a, a poster about escape rooms, and in their little thing, they had puzzles that you could take and do, um, and then on the other side, because it was had a puzzle on one side, and on the other side, it had like kind of a, like a, uh, a synopsis of what they did. Um, so that was kind of fun. Yeah, and I, I usually go to the Society for Integrative and Comparative 
biology, and somebody had, um, their study was looking at um, mantis shrimp and like punching ability. So they had, they were standing there with, um, next to their poster, but with an iPad that had the video going on. And the British Ecological Society actually had the section where they had interactive posters, where it was all online on these touch screens and people could zoom in on different things and have videos involved too. So like, things are changing. <laughs> For sure. Um, but I would say the number one thing you could do is make it as kind of clear as possible. And I am going to just plug Vanessa's again. I think she did a really good job at, at sort of only including what needed to with still enough text that people could actually understand what was going on. Um, and then kind of pretty pictures of data, which I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough pictures of myself. Um, I just have a little bit of what I post Well, and you can, you can arrange it in a way that, um, that you, um, like, if your title's bigger and then this could be kind of under it as your take home message, you can still kind of fill the space with it in a way that's good. Don't, and then the one thing that the better posters guy is talking about is don't be afraid of blank space. It's really not a big, and that's what the, um, what, you know, this format is saying is like blank space is fine. And so you could, you can just move where that blank space is. I yeah, think in a way that works. I see like me moving down everything and then making the title and the author and Stuff yeah, like and you here. can you can rely on your kind of figures to for some of this instead. And so like you can let the especially if these are results, you can have the data kind of talk to themselves. So so Katie's poster, um, the one with the um, this one is a good example. So the um, there's not really a results section, but all of her figures are readily understandable. And so she has her conclusions, but she's not really explaining her results because the data are up there mm -hmm. kind of showing what they show. Um, and so the, the, that's where it's kind of important to think about what's the best way to report my findings. Is it a table? Is it going to be, which usually it shouldn't be a table, uh, or, or how you can kind of do it visually. And visual, um, and actually she does a good job of that in her kind of more methods -y one. Um, visual representations of your methods if you're doing something different is also useful. So this is bad quality resolution here, but she's kind of showing the different methods they use while actually having a picture of the equipment and that kind of stuff. And so if you're doing something different, that's always useful. Um, and there's the kind of setup of how they do it too. So there's different ways you can do it, but trying to find ways to minimize the text and really letting images that's getting a thing now. Journals are sometimes asking for like visual abstracts for your work. And I was just on a grant review panel and grants that had like something like that visually showing what they were doing just made people happier because you're like, oh, that's what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> and so the good thing is like you should be there to explain your stuff. But if people can understand what you've been doing just by kind of looking at pretty pictures. And eyes get tired at conferences too, so you're just like, I don't want to read anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about that. I, mean, I think they're going to find some remote option for the Cougar one, probably. I know uh, we found out about the sustainability conference tomorrow. So I wanted to trip with Mr. Dolan Mara pretty much. Is that the water one? Oh, so you're all going to the same conference. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I'm assuming they'll make that call soon. Um, where is it? Augusta. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah I'm actually volunteering at it to help set up and stuff like that. Okay. It's the only way we'll be able to get down there, so. Especially being at down like 8 in the morning. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not on the Mitchell Center mailing list, so. I find out about it. I feel like not a lot of people are going to be there. All the campuses are closing pretty much. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Glad I had a little bit of how to learn Zoom. Are there any specific questions? Sorry. Um, I don't know how to. Yeah, you covered the good points of like, I like seeing the. Yeah the newness and like the 
that there's no really wrong way. Because mm -hmm. I think once I just start putting stuff on my poster and people mount in mind, it will just kind of. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. in the end, it kind of turns out. Um, okay, so this is kind of a cool one, too. Uh, I've seen things like this. This one's a bit. Like, I would say the background's too strong. Definitely. But I have seen ones like this that have worked really well, where they've just had, like, very minimal. It, it, and it really depends on what you do. It's like any kind of writing. Like, put everything you want on it, and then take as much off as you can while still having the message there. <laughs> and keep a backup in case you need to use it sometime. I have a <laughs> files of writing I liked that I haven't been able to use that still exist on my computer somewhere because I can't bring myself to delete all the work I put into it. Um, but I would say, yeah, if you're looking for ideas, you can kind of browse. There's years worth on this website now, um, including critiques where people can like send their poster in and then have someone evaluate it and say, this is how you can make it better, um, which includes a lot of these. Uh, oh, that's kind of a cool one. So still too much text, but, but it's pretty. Are you looking at the sizes? Yeah, because they're like specific. Like standard for three wide screen. We're starting from scratch here. Wide screen 16 to 9. Oh no, what you want usually is to, there's actually, let me find it. Um, you want to be a bit smaller than the board so it doesn't take it up. But you can get, if you look at, there's PowerPoint poster templates. Um, which I should add the link to. And they come with headings already, but they also come with sizes. So that's really great. And if you didn't know about it already, so campus printing does stuff, but the best way if you ever need to travel to a conference is you can get fabric ones printed online for like $25 if we do it ahead of time. And then you can just put it in your suitcase and then like iron it in your hotel, in your hotel room. Mm -hmm. And it's really great. Assuming like that's gonna exist in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I know Lydia has seen symposiums as opposed to the P4 by three by four. Yeah, so there is a template. Um, okay, so poster templates of all shapes and sizes. What's, what's nice about it, I think so that's what my student, actually I think that's what both of my students used. It's definitely what, um, what Anna used for this one was one of the templates. Because it, it, what it does is it puts it, if you were to go um, to design, this is actually in the size that it needs to be printed, I think. Yeah. So it's 48 by 38. So it means that when you zoom to 100%, it's what it's going to look like printed. So you'll see exactly how big, I mean, this is on a screen, so it's kind of, but you'll see exactly how big everything is, I'm sorry, <laughs> which is useful. Um, and I had just thought of something else, but it's gone now. Oh, Cougar did, for the, the student conference, they do have a poster template, but it's not pretty. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very not pretty. But the good thing about it is that there's those dotted lines that won't be printed and it has the size. And so what I would suggest to my undergrads who are going to be presenting is getting rid of all those boxes and keeping the top bit and keeping that and then just filling the rest with the space the way they want. But it ha at least it has the size that they're going to give you. I will send them my document from the sheet for the next time. <laughs> it, it does help for people making their post, first poster to have some kind of template, but the ones on the, I think the ones on the PowerPoint poster template website are like a little bit better. <coughs> so if we were to choose one from the same size, woo, hello. Um, Can't remember what they actually end up looking like. Yeah. So they have, they come with instructions too. 
that you can usually see of using men on. I think that's online. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah I think it's a good start anyway. And at least it means you know that it's going to print out the right size. So now if you give this to um, a printer, they'll know what size. The, usually what I end up doing though is I would save it as a PDF and then tell them the dimensions um, just because things shift. <laughs> yeah. And if you're going to do it last minute like I always end up doing and you find something and it's got something that's shifted and you just paid like $90 for it, then it's not fun. <coughs> yeah, I've never been great at design, so I, I've never had a poster as fancy as as the as this one, but I really like it. The other thing to think about is the when you design your graphs, you want to do something closer to what you do for a presentation than what you do for a paper. So if you've already written up something as like a manuscript, you want to make sure that the axes are bigger and that's a bit more visual and that things are labeled, um, you know, here as well as in the figure caption. So the same kind of things you'd usually do for a presentation instead of a paper. Although it's getting more common to do that in papers now too. We're getting better at making things more visually appealing, I think, though. Yeah. Or at least my field, I don't know. I think it really helps that you have visually appealing things to work with. It does. Little critters that are cute. Yeah, but you can also make, you can make data pretty. I mean, like, that's pretty as a scientist, I think. <laughs> Minus the bar plots. <laughs> um, the color scheme is a good idea. So just thinking of ways to do that. Um, oh, she's not in Ecology and Evolution. Uh, we had a, um, a lunchtime discussion group, Ecology and Evolution of Everything, that's for grad students. And last semester, we had a woman who's doing her PhD that's also like a design um, videographer person. And when people would give practice talks, she would be really good at picking out, you know, if you were to pick like a symbol that works for this, that goes throughout and we're all just like, oh, that's such a good idea. <laughs> Sometimes it helps to like draw it out first too, like on a piece of paper and then do it there too. Yeah. It's like, it all goes back to find what your idea is. Think about how you want to visualize it and then go through and, and do the writing and everything. And I like the having a kind of modified intro abstract part of it, especially now that the whole people aren't printing out abstract books that they carry around with them anymore. <laughs> it, it used to be a thing. Yeah, thank you. No problem. And you'll be able to send that link around. No questions from the Zoom? No questions from the Zoom? Cool. Well, I hope um, it either does or doesn't get canceled depending on what you want. <laughs> I think people will be understanding of missed professional opportunities in the next few months. I think it's Agreed. sort of what it's going to be my favorite conference is coming up in August and it's over four years and I really hope it can still go ahead. <laughs> I've had a, a conference cancel. I was going to go to an agricultural librarian conference next month in Texas and I was excited for tacos and tortillas. Oh, yeah. And now I don't get to go because I have to fly. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, the professor that I did this research with, he was supposed to be in. Germany over break mm -hmm. to do something and like he can't go now. Yeah. Yeah. I have a colleague who's currently quarantined in Germany because her and her family were skiing in the Alps in Italy last week. <laughs> <laughs> she got out, which is good. But <laughs> All right. Well, then I guess we can call it a night. Um, thank you for coming out. Of course. And I'm glad this was helpful. Thank you for using your poster.
But we can also thank uh, Dr. Katie Marshall from the University of British Columbia for sending us her really pretty ones. <laughs> That's a really good looking dog beetle. It is, right? There's some... Like, that's like the model of dog beetle. And the, this new, like, super high focus imagery that they're doing of insects is just really cool. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder to do with flying squirrels because they're super twitchy. <laughs> Which is why the best picture we could get was sort of that one. But, you know. And this mm -hmm. guy's sleeping. They're cute. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what are you guys, what are you guys presenting on?